Thank you, Janagar. Thank you very much. And we go a long way with uh, uh, China, uh, all my batchmates, Anu and uh, for the form of uh, our group mates. We were one in one group, uh, body group together for anatomy days. And uh, Chadaka is uh, something that all uh, really nice. And we're also so great to meet students who are now consultants, first class consultant. It's so great when you meet them. And, uh, so it was really a great pleasure to give this lecture. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, what I what I will uh, and for the KSM and all those who came here, what I'll do is talk to you about a. Because I would put the elephant in the room. All of us know this is a problem. Uh, when I initially went to Oxford and when I used to come to Sri Lanka and they asked what topics can I speak on. If I said allergies, nobody was really interested in speaking about allergies because it was not a problem at that time. This was in 2000, 2001. But then suddenly people started noticing increasing number of people developing allergies and food intolerances. And that is an increasing problem that you all will encounter across the, across the board. So the handling the elephant in the room, elephants should be in the wild, they should not be... Uh, in room. So if, how do you handle this problem that is it does in the room and how do we manage and diagnose and treat these patients appropriately. So uh, what I'll do is just go through some basic aspects to put you all in the story, skim through certain common allergies, aeroallergen, which a lot of us sneeze, house dust mite allergy, food drug allergy, anaphylaxis, and then some aspects about diagnosis and management. So I always start from a basic schematic, which try to teach the medical students also. If you look at the immune system, if you just remember this pathway, we have the innate immune system, adaptive immune system. What does the immune system do? It's the defense system of the body, the army, the air force, the navy, the police. When viruses, bacteria, fungi comes into our body, those will get activated and get rid of those harmful organisms. And then you have complement also. Uh, so there are adaptive is antibodies and white cells. Basically, that's the two important component. Complement just helps the antibodies and white cells. And lymphocytes are important, the immune system. So that will help to keep you safe from infections, or it's expected to. And if you're the immune system is not working properly, then you get immune deficiency. That's one condition you manage. Now, on the other side of the equation, you find the immune system can misbehave. They can start producing antibodies against our own body cells or white cells, and that is autoimmunity. Or they can react to innocuous things, grass, pollen, tree pollen, cats, dogs, etc., and that is allergy. So that is dysregulated immune system, not that it's underactive, it's overactive in a, a bad way. So you just want to bring it back to the normal state. And then you have cancers. If the immune system doesn't get rid of this, ca this cancerous cell, the cancerous cell will multiply. It has an advantage in, multipli in uh, multiplication and it will produce a lot of cells and then you get the cancer and it takes over the person and consumes the person. So that is the basic part what immunologist does, immune deficiency, autoimmunity, allergy, and we try to reset it back into the baseline. Cytokines is the means by which we speak, uh, by which the immune system speaks. We speak using English, like Singhalese, etc. Uh, uh, the immune system does so using cytokines and chemokines. So that's the language. Different between cells, they will communicate using these different uh, chemicals. So that's in a nutshell what the immune system is and how the diseases, what we treat as immunologists. The, when it comes to allergy, so I focus on allergy today, the eosinophil and the mast cell are two critical cells. Not that the other cells are not important, but eosinophil and mast cell. Don't forget about the mast cell. That is another important cell that you must take into account when it comes to allergies. Now, this schematic is complex. Forget about it. Just to show you, there are lots of chemicals released from the eosinophil. It's a nasty cell. Those two cells were originally meant to get rid of worms, parasites and worms. 
So you had to equip them with lots of chemicals, cytokines and other chemicals. When parasites reduced in the world, then you found that these cells didn't have anything else to do. So what happened was they became important in allergic disorders because if you have a child who doesn't have anything to do, just keeping them at home, they will do something and they might set fire to the home or something like that. So the same way you find if cells are just hanging around, these are evolutionary cells, they can start uh, attacking normal structures, etc. And this is where allergy came, it, uh, they took an important role in allergy. And also, increasingly, the gastroenterologists are finding that eosinophils are starting to come into the gastrointestinal tract, eosinophilic esophagitis, etc. Previously, it was not a condition seen here, but it is increasingly being detected now, and it will increase because with allergies coming in, there's no reason why eosinophilic esophagitis also would not come in. So that's an important because reflux disease, but you have to remember eosinophilic esophagitis where the treatment changes when you're when you treat, treating this condition. So lots of chemicals, similar with mast cells, you have the resting mast cell and the activated mast cell with a load of chemicals in it. Now, I'm not telling you to learn all this, chemicals, just to focus that there's lots of chemicals. And that's what we try to neutralize when we, why I'm putting this, because we try to neutralize some of these chemicals when we treat patients with different allergies. And the important thing to remember is one chemical is histamine. But there are other many chemicals in the mass cell in addition to histamine. So if we look at what is the basic nature of allergic response, you have the allergen, house dust mite, cat, dog, etc. The person inhales it, the person consumes the food, it binds to the mast cell, it binds to the Ig on the mast cell, and then sends a signal, and the chemicals are released from the mast cell. And then you get from a rash, from swelling, some itchy sensation, to breathing difficulty, to collapse, blood pressure reducing, etc. So that is the whole spectrum of condition that the person can develop. I put this schematic because there are two chemicals which are important and it's slowly coming into Sri Lanka. The use of these chemicals that is measuring histamine and tryptase. Now histamine is very difficult. It's, uh, so it, the chemical that is initially measured is tryptase. But we have to remember that tryptase increase that if a person has anaphylactic reaction, anyone come into ICU with an anaphylactic reaction, that is uh, a &E, uh, sorry a and &E should be measuring the tryptase level because we have to know in anaphylaxis the tryptase level increases but it comes back to normal while in mastocytosis which is a rare condition the tryptase level is always high so normally what we tell the tell uh, what a and &E does is they measure the tryptase early on because you can see it take it it is it uh, increases early you don't you don't wait till the person goes home but in clinic you can do a second tryptase level to see whether the person has mastocytosis or which is rare mean most patients have anaphylaxis but it's important in a patient who has repeated anaphylaxis if you cannot find the trigger to exclude mastocytosis because the treatment is so different if the person has mastocytosis but don't get too focused on mastocytosis because that's not the common condition it's anaphylaxis which is the common condition but these are the chemicals that we measure with and the profile. Now, again, a very, uh, now these complex uh, figures don't get too uh, concerned about. I'm just putting it to show the, co the inherent complex part. But you have to take home message are very simple. There is type 1 allergy and then there are different other types of allergy, hypersensitivity. There is type 2, type 3, type 4. Can you remember the Jalen Coombs classification? Everyone, uh, could, uh, remember that so there are different types so why did I put this slide not to confuse you but just to tell you there are some skin conditions some uh, uh, sort of other man clinical manifestations that are due to T cells and that are due to other other cells rather than IgE so the importance of knowing this is if a condition is a T cell mediator that is the white cell mediator you would not do challenge testing when you are di diagnosing this patient. Because sometimes what we do is we get the patient to clinic. If they think we ate five foods, we don't know what we are allergic to, 
one by one we would challenge them to the different foods under control observation if it's one of these conditions you would never challenge because it's dangerous right steven johnson said you won't go and challenge the person because it is a t cell mediator that's why i put that uh, schematic so there is ig mediator the ig mechanism which is type 1 and then you have the t cell mediator which are the other ones like the serum sickness etc and the uh, delayed hypersensitivity right so so th that is important so what are the ways we can get the allergies we can inhale it we can inject get it injected we can ingest it or through skin contact we all know this and the different things which i will discuss so that was a quick run through the basic aspects of immunology and where does allergy fit in and the chemicals etc that are released by the eosinophil and mast cell so aeroallergen is the commonest allergy around the world how many of you would know patients people or relative who are sneeze in the morning as soon as they get up or congestion or drip drip uh, sort of uh, nasal drip or eye has been uh, sort of itchy and reddish that is very very common and house dust mite is the most important cause for that it's the mite found in dust you can't see it it's mi microscopic it's uh, it's microscopic but that is the commonest it's found in everyone's on sheets on pillow cases rugs curtains uh, nets you name it in the room books cupboards etc and that is the first thing to focus on rather than only going for antihistamines because otherwise as soon as you stop the antihistamine these symptoms are going to come because antihistamines are symptomatic treatment they are not curative curative is desensitization which i'll come to later you have desensitization but that's a long process right desensitization long process so when you treat allergy always remember try to work out what is driving it sometimes it's difficult mold another common con uh, condition and house dust mite so aero allergen uh, problems are a big issue grass and tree pollen are big in the uk and lots of children during children and adults during summer they get uh, a grass and tree pollen hay fever one important thing and then pet allergy cats and dogs right and that's a very tricky area to deal with because you can't just say unlike food don't take peanuts don't take uh, uh, beef etc you can't just tell a child you know get it off the cat you just can't do that you know you can't just say get get it off the dog because there is so much of social context involved in in that and then you have to handle it properly and manage the patient appropriately so the important thing is this is the big issue in the uk i mean during the summer in many countries that have four seasons etc big issue children's education the exams around this period and then anyone who has rhinitis would know the trouble it causes right the congestion the headaches the frequent sneeze in the morning if somebody says you know i'm sneezing in the morning first thing you think is house dust mite allergy that's a very important con con uh, condition to to treat and try to look to see if you can reduce the environmental exposure because otherwise taking nasal sprays yes it's important taking antihistamines it's important etc nasal washers are important but if you're continuously exposed to amount of dust mite etc you're going to get change sheets very regularly don't spend a lot of money change in mattresses because the sheet is what you're sleeping on not on I mean you're sleeping on the mattress but you have something a sheet above that right so those are the things to focus don't keep too much of books in the room with all dust collecting etc put them in some other place and keep just a few books or no books so those simple things are very very important this is the sort of thing that happens the congestion this person looks a little like uh, david cameron this picture so at uh, congestion and then you find it just uh, polyps develop and there is block the people can't breathe and the important consideration don't ignore this condition because there is a concept in the, the us united airways the airways are connected the upper airways connected to the lower airway and if you have inflammation in the upper airway and you don't do anything it will spread to the lower airway after some time so the person who started with rhinitis will end up with getting asthma and then they will be going to icu except rhinitis is not a dangerous thing because i mean you sneeze a bit okay you take antihistamine okay 
but then as it goes down you find the condition worsening and getting more severe into the spectrum when it comes into the asthma and the difficult to control asthma so aeroallergen sensitization very important cat dog grass tree pollen uh, house dust mite mold those are the common ones but there are other aeroallergen sensitization and in sri lanka house dust mite for the patient i say house dust mite is a big problem very big problem mold is the other problem right uh, like several uh, greenish material that you find in different wet places wet walls etc or behind cupboards so as a slight leak that is going on just look at those ac is another very important consideration uh, that is found in sri lanka because our ac is the way they design in sri lanka told this if you go to a hotel room you see your ac right on the bed the architects for some reason they put the ac right on the bed and that is not a good process to have it you should put it up i mean depends on the size of the room that is absolutely the room is very tiny you can't we are it's can put the ac but uh, if, if they can there are several rooms you see where the ac can really be put at a different uh, a different level or the vents been put up because if you if, if it's not serviced properly and you, it accumulates mold because there's condensation there's mold there is uh, dust etc you always keep uh, exposing the child or the adult to this problem and so that is another important thing because for some reason they believe that the ac should be right on the person on the bed and that is not the design thing which which people would have to uh, look at in the future next we come on to very important aspect of food allergy and food intolerances i mean you all of you most likely know somebody who has a food intolerance or food allergy so remember that food hypersensitivity there are different types not every reaction to food is a is a is a allergy that's the important thing to remember food hypersensitivity has food allergy non allergic hypersensitivity the reason i told you this is there is something called celiac disease that is not really common here but lactose intolerance very common in south india because we are lactase the gene because the enzyme that is found in our in our intestines the gene the effect of the gene it reduces with age and in especially in males in lots of asian males find it difficult to manage milk after the age of about 40 odd because the amount of lactase they have is low and that too can produce if you take milk or milk products it can produce bloating uncomfortable feeling want to go to the toilet etc so just remember it can be lactase intolerant lactose intolerant rather than a food allergy that's an important thing to remember because it's intolerance lactose and i'll come to histamine intolerance a bit later but remember about lactose intolerance so we are concerned about the most serious one is serious allergies are i can't go for other ig mediated food allergies now in different countries you have different items that are that are responsible for the allergy i've just put the uk once here but in sri lanka we don't have peanuts is not at such a problem we have cashew nuts but cashew nuts is not something we consume a lot we don't consume loads of cashew nuts right but there are other things like beef uh kathurumurunga sarana which are sri lankan sri lankan oriented uh, issues that people have uh that uh, shellfish definitely that we have a different uh, spectrum of different allergies wheat is a problem in sri lanka and meats of special red meats because there is a condition called alpha gal that there is a cross reactivity there is an antibody special red meats people come and say i have problems with red meats however i can take chicken i can take white fish don't discount that because that is a well known condition we have been managing this for the last 10 years or so because we were first described in the us it is a well known condition red meat right red meat allergy so it comes on quite soon it can affect the gastrointestinal tract skin and respiratory system real it's life threatening and uh, i won't go into oral allergy but just also remember uh, no we're going to that. the importance of food intolerance right because not everything is food allergies there are several causes of food intolerance you can see it here right in i mean don't run into psychogenic that's the worst thing to do don't give it because i mean many patients come and say that some 
some uh, uh, their GPs or doctors have said immediately they are disciplined. I'll give you an example. There is a condition called histamine intolerance, which I will come to later on. That is histamine. We all produce histamine when we eat, when we take certain items of food or drink. Now, the histamine has to be broken down quickly. That histamine is essential for life, but it has to be broken down quickly. And that is broken down by an enzyme called diamine oxidase. That's the enzyme diamine oxidase. Some people have low levels of diamine oxidase. So as a result, when they have low levels, the histamine is not broken down immediately. So what happens is, if they, there are foods that contain histamine, if I give you tomato, pineapple, aubergine, uh, avocado, red fish, prawns, crabs, and shellfish, etc., uh, together with uh, 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 spinach, vinegar, have histamine inherently in them. Right? So, if by chance you have gone to the gym, sometimes the person says, I eat prawns, I can eat prawns, there's no problem histamine is released, it doesn't go over the threshold. They go to the gym and they come back, take a red wine and go and uh, or a coffee and then they go and eat some, uh, eat some prawns. Then you're over the threshold because the enzyme is not some and the person gets symptoms. So this is a common presentation. People come and say, one day I can't, or today I, I, I speak to a friend, a lady, she says, one day she takes katharumunga, but that which you can get an allergy also. But the next day, she when she takes it, she gets a reaction. And lots of people have said, no, it's all in your head. That can't happen, right? It must be all in your head because uh, you can't react on one day and not react. That can happen. That is well known. We see a lot of patients who depends on if you take tomato, pineapple, uh, uh, brinjal, plus some uh, strawberries or something at the end. It's high likely if you have low levels of diamine oxidase that you will react. You can develop symptoms like a skin rash or etc. So just remember that condition. The intolerances are important to remember and recognize. So these are the other things, uh, other uh, intolerances which you will see, the different uh, caffeine, alcohol, etc., which red wine, beer, etc., can have a lot of histamine. And it can, if you don't have enough enzyme, you can develop symptoms with those uh, concerns, but it should be each person. Just because the foods have histamine, if you don't have any problem, don't avoid it. There's no purpose because you must look at the foods that you have the problem with. Next, we come on to drug allergy, which is a very, very common condition and people do not know what uh, they could do with it. This is a list of drugs that can produce allergies. Penicillin is common uh, right on the top, but a whole range of other other items can cause allergies. Aspirin, it's not an allergy. It's a as NSA intolerance, right? It, uh, sorry, it's an intolerance because it's due to an enzyme, Cox, uh, Cox. It's not an allergy. So just remember that. But penicillin is a common allergy that is there. We know that the cross-reactive with cephalosporins, it's not as common as what we thought before. So you don't have, not everyone with penicillin allergy, do you have to avoid uh, cephalosporin? So, remember this point but penicillin allergy is a common thing that is present some important myths that are present uh, with regards to uh, penicillin allergy sometimes because penicillin is from um, uh, from uh, fungi uh, that has been some people think that they have they, they should not uh, eat cheese and things like that that is absolutely wrong then it is uh, allergy to penicillin excludes cephalosporin no it doesn't because that's cross-reactive, but it's a small amount that is cross-reactive. So just uh, uh, some of the myths and the uh, known thing. Anesthetic agents, again, I, I just put the list only just to tell you that there are a lot of anesthetic agents that we test for that can produce allergic reactions. Any anesthetists here, just remember that. Why did I put this uh, importantly? Because some of the agents like atricurium, etc., release histamine. It releases histamine. So if a person already has allergies, you would inform your anesthetic in the pre-assessment because they would use drugs that doesn't release histamine. So if somebody has histamine intolerance, this lady I spoke today, she has histamine intolerance, the DA would be low. I would, when she's having surgery, it's best to avoid opioids like morphine, but go to a lower opioid. 
and to not use things like atracurium etc that mivacurium uh, that release a lot of histamine you will try to avoid and use a different drug so that is the clinical implication of knowing these different allergies iv colloids remember gelatin is a big problem in certain groups of patient so just be aware if they start reacting to this by chance if you are using it just just remember about we don't use so much gelatin but if you are using it and they have a reaction just remember about it and the cross reactivity with beef just because with beef appears to be a common allergen in sri lanka quite a number of patients have beef allergy which we don't see that in the uk with regards to beef allergy local anesthetic yes you can develop allergy we wrote an article on this but it's not common so the, the take home message from this slide is just because they have they had some problem when you were giving a local anesthetic don't wait without giving them general anesthetic or some other thing or don't wait without giving them any anesthetic and keep them in real pain because that happens because if the patient mentions some odd thing happens during local anesthesia from that point onwards they can't get a tooth removed because everyone is just nervous to touch them and they really don't want which is really not correct send to an allergist get it tested most often it's negative 99% of time it's negative uh, if it if you have an allergist but don't wait without giving them appropriate uh, sort of an uh, uh, another local anesthetic etc and so and and i told you non steroid anti inflammatory it's not a allergy per se so doing skin test alone is not sufficient it's a different mechanism and we desensitize in the appropriate circumstances as i will tell you so then i come on to this last of uh, this important aspect of histamine intolerance and mast cell activation disorder now a lot of sri lankans are hypermobile we did a study in sri lanka i mean lots of dancers that because you are you are good in your gymnastics etc if you are hypermobile hypermobility right uh, uh, the joints are very bendy and some patients with hypermobility have this spectrum of conditions group of condition they have gi dysmorphia so gastroenterologists see them quite often hots comes in the neurologist and the cardiologist and then you have uh, eds uh, now they have changed that not to but other urinary symptom and other endocrine except center so this combination we are increasingly seen as immunologist and allergist in the in the uk just remember this aspect because sometimes if they are very uh, hypermobile and they have some of these features just uh, uh, consider the as allergy aspect also coming into the into the mix in these patients so that was a quick run through aero allergen the commonest allergy that you will find in sri lanka very common at the moment we are managed you all will be seen so many patients with that and i told you go to the source try to reduce the exposure food allergy drug allergy anaphylaxis anxiety and mast cell activation disorder which is again commonly diagnosed now uh, in certain groups of patients and histamine intolerance quickly running through the diagnostic aspect history is the most important talk to the patient doing tests alone in allergy would not give you a diagnosis now the world is moving in such a way some of the oncologists they see the patient immediately send a genetic test look at the genetic results and they target the treatment based on that this doesn't work in when it comes to allergy when it comes to allergy history is so important they maintain food diaries etc because otherwise you don't know what to talk and i have seen many reports come in let's do panels allergy panels big panels 100 allergens 200 allergens etc and then people get false positives or just the positive come in and then they don't know what to do with those tests they are positive for cotton but they were wearing cotton then they don't know then that become more complicated so always remember the history target your testing according to history don't just test unnecessarily when it comes to allergy testing because it's a waste of money though all these big panels and all are based on unless you have your allerg suspected allergen there like any medical condition history examination and make a differential diagnosis Said, right we did not so skin testing we don't use ras testing it's called fast away we don't use radioactivity now it's called fast testing and challenge testing we challenge if you are uncertain somebody ate a mixed meal and they just can't find the cause of the 
allergic reaction, we challenge them. Double blind is the best, but most often we do an open challenge in this group of patients. Under supervision, nurses can do the thing, but with all the resuscitation facilities, etc. So uh, there are newer methods, which I won't go into detail here. We have a lot of other methods, recombinant allergen, inflammatory methods, etc. But I think this slide is far more important. History is important. You do the specific IG, appropriate specific IG without just ordering panels, which is really not labs will try to say, you know, order panels, etc. It's great to order panels, especially private labs, but it is a waste because it, you are spending lots of money and the 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 improvement you got is far better to put that in, change in sheets and get in three, three sets of sheets rather than just uh, doing a whole lot of uh, uh, allergy tests which are absolutely useless. Skin picking, pick testing is the best test and again, very easy test to do. Again, target it properly. So this is the cutoff that we use 0.35, sometimes we go to 0.1. Atopic dermatitis patients, very common, eczema. Don't get nervous if you see IgEs, total IgEs at 25,000, 20,000. That's the norm, right? Because so many people come to me, 20,000, oh my gosh, we have a big problem, etc. No, I mean, that's the norm we see. Because atopic dermatitis drives the IgE like nothing, right? It really drives it. So 15,000, 20,000, absolutely okay, right? So that is, don't get too worried. When then doing those Allergy panels are absolutely useless because everything will be positive. Because if you have 20,000, it will just stick onto the plate. So then it's far better to go to a uh, skin testing, the selected one skin testing. Generally, skin testing is more sensitive. It's a better better test. But if you don't have skin testing, just do a, don't go and do those big, big panels or just do only very selected. In uh, atopic dermatitis, that too may not be useful because if you have a, a 15,000, getting a... Uh, some uh, level of five positive at five is really not not doesn't tell you very much. Go with your history there. Skin testing. This is what you do. Aeroallergen panel, food panel, etc. And sometimes we tell them to bring the food in. We do a prick prick test. So they bring the food in. We prick the food and then do the skin testing. So that that would also give an exam uh, the, the, the answer. That's called prick prick testing. And this is the basic skin prick testing that that can be easily done. Uh, there is a whole range of tests we don't have. We had it uh, accessible in Sri Lanka at one time pre-COVID, but now that has gone out. So these are the tests we do when we suspect histamine intolerance and mast cell activation. Uh, uh, we we, we uh, get these tests, there are a number of tests, because we can, especially in this group of patients, and I have a special interest in this group of patients, we can manage the patient appropriate, knowing the diagnosis is important. The, the, some of the other advances that are fine, I'll just quickly run through some of the other advances that we have. Now, when you have soy, if you have soy or peanut, etc., you have different proteins. So those are called components. So we can test for different proteins in that food, say soy or peanut, etc. So we can, we can break it down, say so, soybean has these common proteins, these important proteins. So we can do with the whole protein, the whole mix, or with those individual components. And molecular structures have been identified. And we have, sorry, we have certain things. We can do it on an Isaac test on a slide or in a, a standard machine. So these are the newer things that are available to be able to identify and diagnose and treat more complex allergies. This is not for the basic, like like anyone treating now. Janaka won't do all the tests on every person who comes with headache. He would select the appropriate patient to have the test because it is cost effective. If you do the tests and diagnose properly, you will be saving so much more down the down the line and some appropriate. So do, that is very important. Don't these advances don't take it that every person gets every test, right? That is not. It's the group of patients which the consultant, the allergist would see and uh, diagnose properly. Why is this important? Because certain components, we know now certain, if you have peanut, a certain component, they will have more severe reaction, while other components, they will have mild reaction. And why is that important? Because, you know, the sort of desensitization program, because we can desensitize, would we put them on desensitize or not? That is the importance of the components. Then I'll finally come on to management. I've told some aspects of management also, uh, going on the line, uh, down the line. So you have the standard nasal sprays, uh, 
that are there, the nasal wash, desensitization comes in, but basically it's antihistamines, nasal sprays, nasal wash. Try to avoid long course of steroids. Steroids will help oral steroids. It will help, but your your uh, sort of uh, accumulating problems for the future because they go and get asthma, then they'll be put on steroids and it, it just accumulated. And then Charles that will be asked to sort out the other problems that have happened, right? So, so just be careful about that. I put here the uh, uh, down here grass axe and uh, aluta. This is the grass pollen desensitization. That is the only curative process that is present for desensitizing. All the others are symptomatic. So remember, use the try to control allergen exposure as much as possible and as in practical ways without spending a lot of money because that does help quite a lot when it comes to aeroallergen sensitizer. Because if you are exposed to a lot of mold, whatever you do, you can take the medicine to be temporary relief, but if you are continued exposed to mold, you can get more symptoms coming on there. When it comes to food allergy, good avoidance strategies to the best ability. If the person has cashew nut allergy, don't go and give cashew nuts at that time. If they go to restaurants, if a dish comes with cashew nut, just remember, don't uh, tell them to go back. They'll remove the cashew nuts and bring the dish. The protein has already gone. That is wrong. Uh, one small thing with regards to nasal spray, which I just want to, because it's a practical point. When your person uses a nasal spray, it's a common mistake. Shake the bottle, you put it to the nose. Don't inhale it. Like, don't do that. That's wrong because it goes to the throat. When you do that, it just goes to the throat and it doesn't treat. You have to treat. Right, so you put your head back, spray it, two puffs, two puffs, but don't do, it's a common, I mean, that's a very common thing, everybody, and it goes to the throat, you don't like it, the children don't like it, they don't use it, so they say the nasal spray is useless, right, so that, that's a, a practical point again. So food allergy, written treatment plan, we always give them a written treatment plan, and then it comes to the EpiPen, this is another common sort of question that people, because that's so difficult to access the EpiPen here. So EpiPen is sometimes you can't find the allergen or if you can find it, but there can be inadvertent exposures, right? Because, you know, inadvertent exposure means that you have beef allergy, but sometimes you don't realize, or egg allergy, you don't realize that you're, you're taking something containing that and you can get a bad reaction. So you always put a safety net. The safety net is antihistamine, prednisolone, uh, 30 milligram stat dose, and the EpiPen. And we generally, there we give two EpiPens, here we give one EpiPen. And because that is the life safe, that is the drug of choice in anaphylaxis. Not antihistamines, not hydrocortisone, not uh, uh, prednisolone in real anaphylaxis, it's EpiPen. Because it has all the properties of reversing reversing and the changes that occur in anaphylaxis. Remember, it is uh, 0.3 and in, the, in, uh, uh, in adults and 150 microgram in children. And you have to train them because a number of people carry the EpiPen in their pack. They don't know how to use it. And the bystander gets the EpiPen out and they uh, accidentally inject themselves. So the bystander gets the EpiPen and the patient doesn't get the EpiPen. And then both end up in hospital. And then because both are nervous, one person doesn't have any problem, gets every pain, and the person who has it. So that's the important thing about training. Uh, we give a medical basal to anaphylaxis campaign. Penicillin desensitizing can be done. I won't go into detail. This is uh, the protocol that we use. And the medication that we use if a person has histamine intolerance or mast cell activation disorder. We use start with antihistamine. I mean, the important thing is to try and avoid this reaction coming in. Start with antihistamine, but the other drugs that we use is sodium chromolactate, ketotifen, montelukast, etc. Urticaria, angioedema, higher dose of antihistamines are needed. One tablet is not sufficient. A child of about 15 years, 120 milligrams of fixofenadine is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. I've seen many patients children come in with 120, it's not sufficient because they are big. I mean, at, up, it's up okay till the age of about eight, eight, eight to 10 or even eight years, but after that you have to increase the dose, right? So that, that's again another important aspect to remember. So I've just run through, so I tried to give some sort of practical uh, sort of aspects about uh, uh, basic immunology and allergy, aeroallergen uh, sensitization, 
house dust mite, the grass, tree, cat, dog, etc. Food allergy, drug allergy, histamine intolerance, and the other types of lact lactose intolerant. Diagnostic aspects. Uh, how to diagnose? Don't just blunderbuss order all the tests that are possible. Select the group of patient that you want to investigate properly and management. Also take it in a very systematic way. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Saranjit, for that very clear, comprehensive talk. Uh, if you have queries, uh, he's uh, happy to clarify those matters. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Saranjit, for that interesting presentation as always. Uh, my question is come across patients with insulin allergy. And how do you get about it? Right, so very important because uh, I think it's becoming less important now compared to previously when they were using the animal. Sorry, so now it's becoming very much, very, very uh, much less, in, uh, less of a the sense of what we we test them for the for the uh, insulin allergy. And uh, most often we can, if only a few patients have it desensitized, them. we have desensitized it. But most often, it's not a true allergy. It's not a true allergy. Or we, by changing the product, we have been able to overcome that uh, overcome that thing. Yeah. But we can desensitize. Uh, yeah, so uh, in Oxford, uh, they had to ask the patient to take some dexamethasone and then draw the insulin and then eat it. Yes. So, I mean, sometimes, you, but then the, the problem is that... Uh, Problem is if we try, if we can avoid that using the steroid part of it, is is the thing. If sometimes we change the product, we can sometimes get to work because the different epitope, the Ig is against different epitopes, and by chance if the epitope has changed, we can or we uh, because desensitization is, is a problematic process after that. But when it comes to diabetes, because insulin being used regularly, it's okay even if you desensitize. Uh, because one important thing with desensitization is now, so if you aspirin desensitize for life, they should take aspirin. That's the important thing. Rather, you go through the whole now, say, cardiac patient, they send uh, the patient to us to desensitize. The important thing to remember is that you know the patient is not going to be desensitized with a lot of time involved, and then they're not going to take the aspirin also, right? Because some uh, most often we don't. Just desensitize unless the clinical need is really important. It's very, because you have to take the anaphylactic risks, etc. So, so those mechan it's becoming very much less when it comes to insulin. But definitely, from a specialist unit, you would get and then you would have the referral funds. Uh, so most patients in Oxford are with asthma they don't use a list of food. Especially children, they are restricted in what they are allowed to have. And this doesn't really agree with the concept of allergy. Um, one of the strategies that I find may be useful is to do a pick and test. I do, do a? Pick and pick test. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, would you recommend that? Yes. So I think again, targeted through on a, on a, I mean, one thing is when it comes to children, Always be listen to the mother because that or or the or the care right. I mean that's important. They they see the child far more. The interaction with the child is far more what than a clinician. That is the golden rule, right? So after that, I mean you have to uh, you have to use other questions also to clarify any things they say because they might say you know hundred foods that the child can't eat and avoiding. Then you just have to get other questions, subsidiary questions, just to see whether that is reliable and that is the, that is the correct picture. And then from that, now because when it comes to prick prick testing, how many are you going to do? Right? So because, you know, a child, etc. So you have to target it. If you find that the child is, I mean, they are what we do is get a dietitian involved, right? And see the home environment, see everything, what is happening. And then if they say, no, this is, there are maybe certain six or so foods that the uh, that, uh, child may be reactive or we are not uncertain. 
and this is very important for the child because it is important for the growth etc then we would do prick prick test or even open challenge even open challenge we go for open challenge actually we prefer open challenge because the nurses are very trained they are and they, they can do the open challenge easy uh, easier a bit rather than a prick prick because of the problem with the prick prick is that uh, even if the because of the skin test we have to remember that is the diagnostic sensitivity especially not 100% so there are some time there is a there are, there are instances where the skin test is negative i mean i'll say especially with when we go for a challenge we do the skin test right and it can be negative but the uh, challenge can be positive so then you go for the challenge test i think the problem is that doctors because we even instagram exactly they said certain you know, I, i now there is some research not no, some research there's good research going into this element of histamine intolerance coming so that has to be taken into account by certain foods like tomato pineapple spinach uh, as i mentioned aubergine uh, avocado etc has high histamine now asthma is not a histamine driven thing it has allergy worse name but asthma is when it comes to asthma it is more of a t cell driven process especially in the severe asthma so asthma changes from ig you have the allergen but it goes into a more t cell driven so the histamine intolerance you don't take it as significantly in a person with asthma and tell them to avoid all those if they don't have any problem as opposed to somebody has food allergy Because when it comes to food allergies and food intolerances, then you will take put more emphasis on that. But definitely, I agree with you. They should not be just because they have asthma. If the child has asthma, avoid in a whole range of things inappropriate because the child's growth is so important, right? I mean, the child child is not uh, not. I mean, and you know the thing with the al- uh, allergens. Previously, that's an important point. Previously. pregnant ladies used to not take nuts and for 3 years british mums and or european mums used to not give nuts to the child that was making things worse because if you take the nut or any protein if you take a protein through the through the gut the general tendon the general evolutionary uh, pathway is tolerization we can eat certain things we are tolerized to the food now if you don't eat that food and we have eczema and are exposed to nut proteins or whatever bee proteins etc through the skin then you are going to the skin sensitization gets it to the allergy pathway the ige pathway the th2 pathway while the gut sensitization goes to the other path the th1 pathway so just telling parents don't give this food go and give that food don't give uh, 150 food you'll be actually doing a disservice to the child rather than really helping the child if the mother comes and says you know the child took an egg we just tried to give an egg and spoiled it and the child had a facial swelling then you're not going no go and take this egg because you know you don't tell that don't 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 worry you go and take i'm not like that. but the important thing is trying to avoid too many foods during childhood uh, it is absolutely counterproductive because you will be you, you they be meeting it through the skin now a lot of children have eczema right and that's a common common condition they be meeting it through the skin and they actually get in allergy sense right? rather than being tolerance and that's a very important i didn't go on to that initially but important allergy as a result of autoimmune as the prevalence has increased among the middle aged population in the 40 45 age years group and the probably the if you did the history and thing so they are allergic to the common hero allergen food or the drug allergy you not really need them to try to do in their young they the first time they get the allergy to the middle age yeah that type of population is a little bit now 
large number of cases they have a reason for the hair but some of the cases we really can't find the proper of the reason for the allergy and we are concerned with the situation so what is the evidence of not of the allegation of the genetically modified food is the cause of the risk so what is so is the regarding genetically modified food? yeah so very very good question i mean firstly i think our the way we live has changed right we come to genetically modified but the way we live has changed. i'm just look back a lot of you all right are some of you all are very young so the same right we are we are older they say i mean when we were where did we have acs windows closed uh not no opens children sitting on sofas uh, looking at uh, tvs and on their uh, on their uh, sort of uh, phones uh, and the food we eat the kitchen has been has been uh, sort of uh, outsourced to the shop all the shops that are coming by on this on the way home right so our lifestyle has changed right a lot the way the way we uh, some people have carpets a whole lot of carpets accumulate dust so that that has to be taken into context right because the uh, the way we are living is so different to how we lived previously children were you know always playing and you know running around etc now they're sitting at home and looking at the, looking at their phones so with regards to genetic modified foods etc that is just one aspect people have looked at it but i think the if the dot i think the evidence is not you know yes it is of course of the problem etc it's not there right so there are gut bacteria is another important thing that a lot of studies have been doing probiotics prebiotics etc but the evidence base is limited evidence means there's a lot of reason but very contradictory evidence so you can't say yes it is or yes it is not right when it comes avoiding peanuts less uh, for too long can increase the allergy risk up to peanut is very clear there were very well defined studies that showed the thing so i think it should be taken in the whole context because i know in the us lots of gm foods are there in europe though they say that banning etc there is lots going on it has into the food chain right so the important thing is in addition to those other areas like the we are really answered the evidence base is answered we have a lot of other ways that we could and i think everyone parents teachers pediatricians adults etc who have children can increase the to reduce allergy prevention is important when it comes to the our lifestyle measures etc and how we how we uh, like one other additional point i must tell you don't think that immune deficiency and allergy are conditions affecting children alone that's a important thing i've had many 80 year old 80 year old patients coming with hay fever for the first time in their life because patients come and say uchra kal kaya va kaya allergy ekak ne then thamai allergy and they are 50 years that can happen it's just the time that the ig mediate the molecule comes in contact with the with the food that is related and i am really agreeable with you autoimmunity and allergy that i see some patients in sri lanka i mean the number of patients i see you all will see the rump of the patient but it has really really increased uh, autoimmunity and allergy lots of autoimmunity around also okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? The absence of questions. Hello. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, I am Chandani Udigadara, dermatologist. Actually, go ahead. 
Hello. Hello. Go ahead, Shantanu. Uh, sir, I would like to ask about. Yes. Hello. 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 I can hear you. Sir, um, yes, I would like to ask about uh, the concept of hot foods and cold foods. Are they allergies or are they uh, reactions? Or food, sorry, sort of food intolerance. It would be intolerance, definitely. If there is anything there, I mean, you have to investigate it properly because you know some people might inappropriate say, you know, hot foods, cold foods, etc., whatever you, you call that, see the law, etc. But if there is anything, it's there is you have to look at the histamine intolerance per perspective of it. You can't say there is nothing at all. But uh, say something like red fish, etc., is a lot of histamine. And if it's processed food, a lot of histamine can develop. But uh, it would not talk with the allergy spectrum, the IgE-mediated allergy spectrum. Because the problem that we have in uh, with uh, uh, when patients come and tell you is anything is an allergy. They describe anything, a rash, uh, anything is an allergy. So uh, that is more the intolerance spectrum. Thank you. Sir.